Hi, I'm Dr. Diana Zuckerman. I'm president of the National Research Center for Women and Families. We're a nonprofit organization that is focused on using research to improve programs and policies that affect the health and safety of adults and children, and we particularly focus on FDA issues. I'm also a fellow um, at the Center for Bioethics at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm trained at, in epidemiology at Yale, and so I'm going to use my scientific perspective, uh, not just, uh, I'll be talking about some of the research findings, but also to put in perspective all the uh, individual stories that you're going to be hear hearing today, because it's that pattern that's really very important and an, an important part of epidemiology, not just the data. Um, I actually do want to start out by saying that um, in my training as a psychologist and an epidemiologist, there's a lot of problems with self-reports, the kind of subjective research that you've just heard about. The FDA's mission, as you know, is to ensure the safety and effectiveness of medical products. And when we think about LASIK surgery, we have to think of the context, and that is that there are safe and readily available and less expensive alternatives, namely contact lenses and glasses. Now, it's clear, and it'll be even more clear as the day goes on, that there are many patients that have been harmed by LASIK. And so the question is, what are those benefits and what are the risks? There's very good information on the FDA website uh, about the risks, but who reads the FDA website? And so as this advisory committee is looking and asked about what should be on the FDA website, please keep in mind and remind the FDA that there are other mechanisms that are more effective at getting information to patients than the FDA website and than um, uh, product labeling. But even though the FDA website has good information, there are problems with it. Parts of it are very difficult to navigate, and particularly the parts that have to do with individual devices, individual LASIK devices. Uh, that information is really not appropriate for patients. It does not seem to be geared towards patients. And, it's, um, and even the patient booklets that are available on the website and that apparently are available through uh, device manufacturers are really not designed to help patients. They're much too long. They're much too sophisticated in their use of language. And frankly, they look like grad student homework assignments. So they're not really designed to be read. And if, because if they were, they wouldn't start out with a rather complicated biology lesson about uh, the eye. So to be blunt, they seem to be, these patient booklets seem to be designed to satisfy somebody at the FDA who doesn't actually care whether any patients actually read or understand these booklets. I want to conclude my remarks by commenting on the questions that you're going to be addressing today because there are several adverse reactions that really aren't, don't seem to be part of those questions that you're talking about, but they should be, and I hope you'll make sure that they are. And most important is eye pain and dry eye, which you've heard some about. Uh, dry eyes are the most common complication from Lasix. The most recent research shows that half the patients have adverse reactions of, like dry eye during the first week of surgery, but that 20% persist at six months. And these problems are more likely among women patients and those with uh, attempting higher corrections. Eye pain can be caused by dry eye or it can come from other causes. But whatever, it's terribly debilitating and these are serious complications that really need to be included in the advice that you're gonna be giving today. The need for additional surgery is also very important and something that has to be studied appropriately. Research that was just published uh, this year in the American Journal of Ophthalmology reported that 28%, 28% of eyes corrected through Lasix needed retreatment within 10 years because of either undercorrection, overcorrection, or regression. And that's 28% of the eyes, and it's even higher if you look at the patients. It's 35% of the patients. That's a very high percentage. And patients need to have that kind of information before they make any kind of decisions. The possibility of a higher suicide rate among patients has been raised and will be raised. More research and really good quality, objective scientific research is needed. 
I tried to get that information. I contacted Emory University, but was not able to get better information about that research, which it has not been published. Overall, patients do not seem to have informed consent when they have LASIK surgery. Would and you be able to? Uh, yes, I will. Yes. Thanks. Part of the reason is lack of data, but it's also because, as we know, health professionals tend to focus on the consent part of informed consent, not the informed part. Informed consent is a process. It's not a piece of paper. Um, even the best will be undermined if uh, agree with what's there. So I hope that you will address informed consent today.